Very little is written about this story. All I had to go on was that the guy's name was Jacob Hostetter, he was from Pennsylvania, and he had a son named David. Weirdly, there's a lot of Jacob Hostetters in Pennsylvania with a son named David. I followed several around for a good while, and some of them said they were druggists, some of them said they were grocers, I wasn't sure which one I was looking for. Finally, I stumbled upon this record, which finally pinpointed which guy we're looking for. Once I unlocked that clue, the floodgates opened. I found so much information I didn't even know what to do with it all. So let's explore this story on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. So this record says Dr. and Colonel Jacob Hostetter was born in 1791 and he died in 1859. He married Mary Landis. He manufactured the well-known Hostetter stomach bitters. He had a son, David, born 1818, and he died in 88. Well, here's Jacob, and here's David. This family reuses the names Jacob and David a lot. First of all, the family has a rich history in Pennsylvania. The family has been in Pennsylvania since the early 1700s. This record says a Jacob Hochstetter came over from Germany and in 1712, he bought some land from agents of William Penn. It says he was a Mennonite minister and the Indians were his neighbors and they were always friendly. If we skip down three generations, we're to our Jacob Hostetter and that's who we wanna talk about. He was born in 1791 in Pennsylvania. I thought here were some interesting things written about him. It says, Dr. Hostetter believed and carried out some old customs of his ancestors. He put salt in the mouths of his grandchildren and gave them his blessing, much as it was done in the Bible days. And although a physician, he believed in a curious faith cure too. He told his daughter-in-law that it had been handed down in his family for generations, communicated by a man to a woman and a woman to a man. He promised to teach her the way, but he never did. When he visited her once, one of her maids had scalded her hand he breathed on it and prayed, curing it at once. It goes on to say the bitters, made of herbs distilled in spirits of wine, was a prescription used by him with so much success that he finally decided to manufacture it on a commercial scale. In 1820, I found Jacob Hostetter in the paper. He was running for Congress for the county of York. My eyes perked up whenever I saw this guy, Joseph Heaster. He's actually my ancestor. I wasn't expecting to bump into him today. Skipping ahead to 1830, Jacob would be 40 years old now. This says Jacob Hostetter, formerly a judge of the Common Court of York County, Pennsylvania, and a member of Congress of the United States. So we see that he's a respected, upstanding citizen. In 1833, this says the enrolled militia residing within the bounds of the 1st Brigade, 4th Division, are hereby notified that they are requested by law to meet for the purpose of training and exercises, etc., etc. And it lists here that the 18th Regiment is commanded by Colonel Jacob Hostetter. We might as well introduce Jacob's son David at this point. He was born in either 1818 or 1819 and married Rosetta, and they had five kids. This article tells a little bit about his life. It says, when young David was about 15, he worked for a dry goods store. When David was about 23, he started his own dry goods store, but it wasn't very successful. When he was about 31, he went to San Francisco, California. Yeah, he was a 49er. Anyone who read up on the 49ers know how hard of a trip it was to get there. Part of the trip was on mules through Panama. Seven of his companions died of fever on the way. He was unsuccessful at finding gold, and he decided to establish a store there. Well, it burned down within a month. So he came back home, and that's when he was given the recipe for the bitters. David then partnered with a guy named George Smith, and then he started in the manufacture of the bitters, which bears his name. It says during this time, there was a guy named Dr. Green, who was also making stomach bitters, known as Green's Stomach Bitters. It says that Hostetter got the receipt and made it the basis of his own bitters, which much resembled it. It says he may have also got the receipt from a Dr. Fabenstock. 
It says wherever the receipt was obtained, the result showed that Hostetter had the ability to make folks buy the nostrum and to wring a fortune out of it. Now let me just stop right there for a second. Because why did he need the receipt for some other guy's bitters if him and his dad already had a successful recipe? I'm missing a piece of the puzzle here. The article says that his firm was met with perfect success, starting out with only six hands. In a few short years, he had over 200 people working in an extensive establishment full of costly machinery. So why does this give the impression that he started from nothing and built the empire himself? I'm still kind of confused here. This article mentions his dad, but it doesn't say that his dad had anything to do with the manufacturing of the bitters. It says, the father of David Hostetter, Jacob Hostetter, MD, was born in 1791, graduated at Jefferson Medical College, and became widely known as an able practitioner, and died in 1859. This article says David was an organizer of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, where he was one of the promoters and prime movers in the organization and development of the South Penn Railroad, which is organized to oppose the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. He was involved with several gas companies, president and director of various banks and other corporations. Someone wrote about David. They said, those who as strangers look upon David Hostetter see a man of brain and strong willpower and instinctively accord to him the possession of faculties of the highest order. It continues, his personal and business reputation is of the highest possible character and he is admired and respected wherever known. His means are never used to harm humanity, but have always gone to aid in benefiting the public. Now that we've gotten to know David a little bit better, let's look at this from 1853. Dissolution of partnership, Charles Green, David Hostetter and Robert Addis, under the name of Dr. Green and Company, is this day dissolved. David then partners with a guy named George Smith. The following year, in 1854, this newspaper ad is the first time I see Dr. Hostetter's celebrated stomach bitters. This is the year after he and Green broke up. The following year, in 1855, more ads in the paper, but one of them is from Missouri, so we're already starting to branch out. This 1855 article says, This morning, Frederick Morat was held to bail by Justice Black for $500 on charge of obtaining money under false pretenses by selling a counterfeit bitters in a bottle with a similar label to Hostetter's. This is the search in the newspapers.com. When I put in Hostetter bitters in the date 1854 and 1855, we already see this many states light up as having a newspaper with those words in it. By 1857, it's this much, and then by 1860, and then by 1865, and then by 1885, the whole map has an ad or is talking about the bidders in their newspapers. Here's an 1859 ad in a Pennsylvania paper. Also, in 1859, David's third child is born, David Herbert. This is third generation to be in the family business. He went by D. Herbert in most of his records. He then married Miriam, and they had four kids. Here's a look at the household in 1860. David Sr. is listed as a druggist. He's 40 now. And here are the kids he's got up till now, including D. Herbert here, who's one. An 1861 directory shows D. Hostetter of Hostetter & Smith, bitters manufacturers. I looked up the address Water Street and Front Street. They don't cross anymore. And there's no 58 Water Street and there's no 58 Front Street. So, bummer. Here's an 1863 bitters ad. Everything we've learned so far and we're just now coming up to the Civil War. This article says Hostetters gained tremendous popularity among the Union Army. They said it was called Dutch Courage. A historian commented, Many a frightened Yankee at Gettysburg knew he faced Pickett's charge as bravely as he did because of the swig of Hostetters under his belt. By the end of the Civil War, he was selling $750,000 a year. 1865 Directory and Hostetter and Smith are still together. Here's an 1866 ad. Avoid counterfeits. 
Here's 1867, 68, and 69 ads looking very much like every other ad around this time where their medicine cures practically anything that you might have wrong with you. 1870, 51-year-old David has two more kids now completing their family. David's occupation says manufacturer of bitters. 1877, Hostetter and Smith are still together. It's been probably almost 25 years now. There were many several years Hostetter printed the Hostetter's Almanac. Apparently by 1899, 12 million copies of this almanac would be distributed annually. In 1878, David's oldest son Harry died at the age of 23. He was studying abroad. Apparently he was a super smart kid and he was in Italy at the time. He caught an illness there and he died. The following year, David's second oldest child, Amy, gets married. Besides the numerous people that are coming to it, it mentions that the presents of the bride's father were worth over $100,000 and he's given her a million dollars in bonds. 1888 census shows us the household, the three youngest kids living at home, along with Amy and her new husband. Her husband is a chemist, and I wonder if he's working for the family business. David Herbert is now 21, and he's working as a bank clerk. It turns out he's actually working at one of his dad's railroads. The enumerator asks if anyone in the house has a sickness. Wilfred here is listed as having an abscess. Three years from now, Wilfred ends up dying. This 1883 article in the paper discusses the subject of bitters. Some chemists have put together some studies and opinions of the bitters. This Dr. Davis had to say this about the bitters. The decoctions usually sold by druggists under the name of bitters are composed of bad whiskey, worse molasses, and just enough organic matter to give them a bitter taste. No reputable physician would prescribe them, and they are simply disguised intoxicants. They contain no drugs that are beneficial to the system, and the deluded mortals who continue bitters, believing it to be a health-giving drug, are sadly deceived. The interviewer asked him, well, isn't it necessary in the case of the Hostetter's bitters, for instance, that such a large percent of the alcohol should be used to hold the other ingredients in solution? He says, not at all. These decoctions containing organic matter are liable to sour in a solution with sweetened water, and it's necessary to put it in about 6% alcohol to prevent fermentation. So 32% alcohol is far too much and is little better than poor whiskey. Later in the discussion, another guy says, I have no doubt that nine tenths of all Hostetter bitters that are drank are drank for the whiskey, not as a medicine. In 1887, Dr. Hostetter will soon have a life insurance policy for $1 million. It says that life at present carries the largest insurance policy in the United States. It says Dr. Hostetter, the railroad and patent medicine manufacturer is the person referred to. His death alone would be worth $600,000 to his heirs, which is what his current life insurance policy is for. His ambition is to leave $1 million, this year hoping to add $400,000 to his policy. It goes on to say that it was only 40 years ago that Dr. Hostetter peddled his bidders around in the streets from a pack on his back. Now he's the largest and wealthiest patent medicine man on the continent. It goes on to talk about his interest in the Pennsylvania Railroad. It says the doctor also has the recipe for the bitters on two small sheets of paper that he keeps locked up in his private safe at home. It says he's 70 years old now and makes two trips to New York every month on railroad business. Also in 1887, an article about a guy who was brought in before police on charges of being intoxicated. He says he drank nothing but Hostetter's bitters. He was found guilty. And then another person got drunk on the bitters and it says he was thrown from the wagon and killed. A year after David talks about taking out a million dollar life insurance policy on himself, he died in 1888. I don't know if he ended up succeeding in getting all that done in time. Letters of administration on the estate of David Hostetter were granted yesterday to his son, David H. Hostetter, the bond being fixed at $2 million. That would make the personal estate amount $1 million, which is thought to be a low estimate. In 1889, a new generation of Hostetters is born. Here, let's get a chart going. We're only going to chart from the Hostetter that started the bidders, and then here's the David that just died. 
Okay, so in 1889, a new ad for the bitters claiming increased vitality, weight gain, tranquil nerves, sound appetite, and sleep are some of the benefits of this medicine. 1890 census. David Herbert is president of the business. Theodore here is David's brother. He's vice president. 1893, this is interesting. Some relatives of the recently deceased David are accusing David of some fraudulent activity. There's a lot of legal talk in here and I'm not good with deciphering all of that, but I wanted to talk about a couple of details of the story in here. It says that soon after David joined his dad's firm, his dad Jacob became mentally impaired that they actually say he became an imbecile until he died in 1858. The claim is that during that time when Jacob was incapacitated, that David was doing some stuff with fraudulent intent, taking advantage of his dad since his dad didn't know what he was doing. We never heard some of those details yet. So after all this legal talk, this article basically says that these relatives are looking for their piece of the pie. Well, a few months later, it turns out that they didn't get it. It says that they were barred by the statutes of limitations. Another drunk guy blows into town, apparently drunk on bitters. But then another ad claims to do a study on 100-year-olds, and they want to consider the reason for longevity is Hostetter bitters. Here's a look at 1900 census David Herbert's household, his wife, two kids, two servants. In 1902, Theodore, the current vice president and David's little brother, died at the age of 32 from pneumonia after being sick for less than 12 hours. It says Theodore owns a lot of boats, including yachts. The following year, we don't see a vice president. We see a Mr. Rob as a secretary and treasurer. 1906, that was a big year for patent medicines. There was a big crackdown on quack medicines. This article says that the bitters can be made under a revised formula, most likely getting rid of most of the alcohol, and selling it as a medicine, not a beverage. 1906, we see a few ads with the bottle and the label. 1910, we've got quite a household now. David Herbert is 50 now. We've got the wife, four kids, eight servants. And by 1915, David Herbert Jr. gets married and here's a photo of David Herbert Jr.'s wife, Margaret. And here she is in the paper. Now we're talking about this guy. All right. Apparently, he and his siblings were brought up pretty strict. Boys were not allowed to be around other girls, and girls were not allowed to be around other boys. So the first chance he got out, he ran out and eloped with her. His parents hadn't even met her yet, and they were already married. Yeah, they had to feel the wrath of that one afterwards. Well, David Herbert Sr. died in 1924. It says he died suddenly yesterday. He was with his wife and daughter. It says his gas companies were, years ago, absorbed by a Philadelphia company. He was the director of several financial institutions and had large realty holdings in Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. It says he was very fond of golf and pretty much any outdoor sports in general. After he died, his son Frederick became president, but he died in 1931 at just 39. So I assume David Herbert Jr. assumes the role of president at this point. So this article says around the beginning of World War I, Hostetter's bitters quietly died. I checked and they were wrong. It was around the beginning of World War II, actually, because I found the listing in 1934. But the next time I try to find them in the directory, it's not until 1943 and they're not there. So the company dissolved somewhere between 1934 and 1943. David Herbert died in 1950 in California. His obituary says that he had lived in California for 30 years. Now let's look at my bottle. I bought it on eBay, and when I first got it, I immediately thought it was a reproduction because the neck looked machine-made and I was expecting a blown bottle. 
But upon further inspection, I see that the bottom has the imperfections and it looks a little bit more period. And now knowing that they were in business until the late 30s, maybe even early 40s, there would be some machine made bottles out there. There are some variants out there I was able to find online. Someone said that there's up to six variants out there of this bottle. So their business ran from 1853 until let's say maybe late 30s. So a good 80-ish years. Not a bad run. And I wonder if there's any descendants out there that still have some of that millions of dollars. That would be interesting. Anyways, that'll do it for today, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.